Welcome guys. In this session, we're going to go through needs and solutions. Of course, when we're talking about needs, we're talking about from the prospect's point of view. And when we're talking about solutions, we're talking about what the prospect is willing to buy, what they're willing to spend their money on, and what they're willing to spend their money on today. So when we talk about needs from the prospect's point of view and solutions that the prospect's willing to spend money on today, we're actually talking about presenting those ideas in a logical sequence of one thought leading to the next. Remember, people talk from their frame of reference and people hear from their frame of reference. So the reason you want your presentation to be logical and to lead from one thought leading to the next is because that creates the effect of all the ideas being powerfully combined, and it leads your prospect to the conclusion to buy now. The reason you want it to be your prospect's idea is if you ask your prospect a question, for example, a math question, and you give them the answer, then what you're doing is putting them in the emotional position of believing you. And if they find out that something you said during your presentation or subsequent to the sale wasn't exactly accurate, then you risk that relationship. But when you ask a question that puts your prospect in the position of coming up with their own answer, they tend to believe their answer. And when they believe their answer, they're more likely to buy something that they believe in. And that's a skill set. Now, I know that when we think about asking questions, it doesn't seem that complicated. But a lot of times, what I hear salespeople do is they ask problem questions. They ask questions that either create a problem or uncovers a problem that wasn't a problem before, or it raises sales resistance in the prospect's mind. So we're going to talk a little bit about what kind of questions are problem questions that can impede the prospect from making the buying decision today. Some of those problem questions are questions that do not ask for immediate action. The question is phrased in a way that leads the prospect to believe that you don't expect them to do anything right now. For example, is there anything else you'd like to know? Have I made everything clear? Now do you have a good understanding? Can I leave a brochure with you to look over? When did you want to get started? All those things should have been taken care of during the pre-qualification. And you do, would never want to ask a question like, can I leave a brochure, which gives the prospect the impression that you don't expect them to do business with you. Those kind of questions raise doubts in your prospect's mind. I always equate it back to the doctor. You don't feel well. You go to a Dr. A, you describe your symptoms. Dr. A tells you, I know what's wrong with you. You can have this medication, or you can have this medication, or you can have this medication, or you can have this medication. Which doctor do you have more confidence in? Dr. A, or you go to Dr. B. Dr. B examines you. You tell him what your symptoms are, and he says, okay, I know what's wrong with you. He writes a prescription, hands it to you, says, fill this prescription, and take it twice a day for 10 days and come back and see me. But which doctor do you have more confidence in? Most people have more, most confidence in Dr. B. And why is that? Well, it's because he diagnosed the problem and prescribed the solution. You want to make sure that you avoid questions that does not leave the impression that you have the ability to prescribe the solution or that you don't expect them to make a buying decision or do something today. Now, in order to do this, in order to be able to ask these questions, we do have to focus on the relationships we develop with prospects. I always give this example, and I think of the health insurance agents that I've worked with over the years that ask all these health questions. For example, you're walking down the mall, a, a middle-aged lady is walking towards you, and as she approaches the other side of you as you're crossing each other, you step over to her and say, excuse me, how much do you weigh? What medication are you on? Would you ever think of doing that? Well, of course not. But so many times salespeople are on the phone with a prospect for a minute and 10 seconds and they're asking questions they haven't earned the right to ask yet. But we have to pay attention to the relationship. We have to look at what the 
process is in building that relationship that will allow that prospect to feel like that uh, buying decision is theirs and the solution that you're helping them design is a solution that they're willing to pay for today. Now, I will tell you that selling includes both objective facts and subjective impressions. You know, people buy on, on emotion, but they're moved to action by logic. And my experience is that prospects will do business with someone that they like. And you, it's important to take enough time in the beginning, during the meet and greet and the warm-up, and the pre-qualifications to lay that foundation. It's important that you just be yourself. Don't try and be somebody that you're not, because you'll be regarded as insincere. And in order to be yourself and have that relationship building skills with prospects, it's important that you know your product or service. That's the sales strength. The more you know your primary product and, and ancillary product, the more you can focus on the relationship, the more you can hear the dominant buy-in motive, and the more you can ask questions to gain an understanding of the things that, that matters most to your prospect. Knowing your product and your service inside and out is a sales strength. It promotes confidence. And by having confidence in what you do, you can expect the best from your prospects. You can approach and respond to each prospect expecting the best from them because they're getting the best from you. So when we talk about expectations, we already know that there are certain things that prospects expect. And we already know that there are certain things that salespeople expect. But I want to explore a little bit about what this expectation is and make sure that your expectations are realistic and maybe look at how we can uncover what the prospect's ex expectation is. And then how can we lay a foundation to tell the prospect what they can expect from us? So the three most important things I would tell you to expect is, number one, expect to win. It's a numbers game. You're not going to get in every door. You're not going to close every deal. You're not going to get every prospect on the phone. But because it's a numbers game, you can create your metrics over a 90-day period of time where you can learn what your numbers are and you can learn what to expect. So expect to win. You don't, you don't have to win every call. Just don't lose but just don't lose the process. Expect to win in the long run by putting together your numbers and managing your business based on expectations of what your results are because you track your results. Expect to like your prospect. Most prospects have had numerous encounters with salespeople over their lifetime, and they are predisposed to having certain defense mechanisms and certain sales resistance. So it's important that you be, kind of, be the kind of person that likes people. It's important that you expect to like all your prospects, even the ones who don't buy from you, even the ones whose initial reaction may feel like they're being negative towards you. Because expecting positive responses from those you meet gives you a better foothold to expect positive responses. People will tend to respond from people that they like and people that are easy to communicate with. So make sure that you set your expectation from the get-go that you're going to get positive responses from everyone you talk to. Lastly, I want to talk about what is that contract or application? What does it represent? What does it mean for you, your company, and your prospect? It's important to have a good understanding, a good gut check of what that contract represents so that you don't get hung up on the minors and you can focus on the majors in your business. That contract or application is a means to an end. It represents the roadmap to getting paid and building your book of business. It directly affects communication, communication between you and the prospect, the prospect and you, between you and your company, and your company and you. It affects communication between your prospect and your company, and it affects communication between your company and your prospect. But what other communication does it affect? It affects your communication with future prospects and future customers. It affects your income. It affects how you communicate with your family. It affects how you communicate with coworkers. Because if you don't have the contract or the contract doesn't go well or the application isn't approved or installation isn't done, that all has an effect on your attitude. And your attitude determines how you're communicating with people. 
the contractor application affects the smooth flow of business. When you have a clean application, a clean contract, your business runs smoothly. You don't waste time or energy going back cleaning up things that could have been taken care of right from the get-go. And your prospects appreciate that you're detail-oriented, that the details matter to you and that you get it correctly. If you feel like you have to rush through a contract application because the prospect might change their mind, it might be, not be the right fit anyway. You probably shouldn't be right in the business. The contractor application affects your commission income. It affects your commission income because it outlines the specific product or service the prospect's buying, at what price, what the terms are, and it affects when and how you get paid because if the contract is clean and everything goes well, if the application is clean and everything's approved, and the installation or the delivery or the service takes place in a timely manner, then you can count on when your income is going to come in. And so by having an attitude of doing things right the first time, it affects your commission income, and it, it helps uh, get rid of those pitches in your commission income going up and down and not knowing when you're going to get paid. The contractor application uh, is a, represents a satisfied paying customer. And the more satisfied paying customers you have, the more confidence you build up in yourself, the better reputation you have, the more security you have in your income, the better chance you have of getting referrals. So all of these things tie into having a book of business that builds you a seven-figure in business and a six-figure income. The contractor application represents prompt service and support for your customers. Now and in the future, there's no question of what services or product they bought. There's no question of what uh, support they are entitled to because it's all spelled out in that properly written contract. And the contract represents for your company, company profits. That contract actually represents how your company earns their money and how that money is disseminated to you. So whether you work for yourself or you're working for someone else on a commission basis or a salary plus commission or whatever you're getting paid, you're still operating your own business. You have to think of the company profits as your profits. So that contract affects your company profits, which affects your long-term business. That contract or application could be the combination of an effort that's extended over a long period of time. Maybe your sales process is long. Maybe you have two or three or four meetings before you can close the deal. Maybe you've done direct mail uh, and phone calls. Maybe you've gone out two or three times on presentations. But it's a combination of an effort that's taken a, a long period of time. That contract or application could have been signed at midnight or in a cornfield where the quality of handwriting was a minor consideration. Regardless of how you get to that contract or application, stop, take a breath, be professional, and do it right. Your prospects will appreciate it, your business will prosper, and your reputation and credibility in the marketplace will be better. That contract or application could be the result of a thousand direct mail letters or dozens of phone calls. But that's that's what represents a real professional. If you can be as energetic and excited and engaging in the 80th phone call today as you were on the first phone call, that contract, that application represents every phone call you made, just not the phone call or just not the, the, the mailer that you followed up on that got you that contract. It represents all of them. So have respect for all activities of your business. And the contractor application uh, is the end product of a comprehensive presentation. Regardless of how you get that business, they're buying you, your company, and your product or service. That's who the prospect is buying. So by paying attention to the contract and application, by dotting all your I's and crossing all your T's, and making sure the prospect has a good understanding of what they're spending their money on, you have the ability to have a clean contract or application and get your business done in a way that your six-figure income and your seven-figure business is not harmed. And lastly, the phone call could be just from a repeat customer. No matter where you got that contract or application from, you treat all of it with the same respect and the same service. And as usual, you can click here for more trainings that you can view or attend. You can click here to book your next training or 
get more pricing outside of 